So uh, thank you for the honor of the podium. I'm here to present the pro stance on robotic inguinal hernia repair, entitled A Pinnacle of a Pioneer's Vision. These are my disclosures. Now, while I know many of you are excited here today to watch two short ball dudes within a cage match, being the classic rebel that I am. Do we have volume? Being the classic rebel that I am, I've opted to take the high road less traveled. And instead of throwing wild haymakers at my opponent, I stand before you today to honor a true friend and mentor. Now, Edward L. Felix was born a very long time ago <laughs> in the sordid streets of Chicago. Yet even within this hardened environment, he overcame the odds, graduating from the University of Michigan. In pursuing of his dreams to become a medical professional, he graduated with honors at the University of Illinois Medical Center, site of which he also completed his surgical training. This marked the beginning of a storied surgical career. Uh, volume? I'm sorry, I have to play this volume. You gotta plug it in. Is the volume on? <laughs> so this marked the beginning of, a, of an amazing surgical career, career in which he was able to amass a CV worthy of only the chosen few, significantly contributing in the sciences of oncology, bariatrics, and of course, hernia repair. He fought hard championing the virtues of laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. He, along with the others imaged in this photo, taught the world both TAP and subsequently TEP repairs. And his mentees now were not only able to offer this approach, they were equipped with the fund of knowledge and the skill set to train others, which makes and translates for Professor Felix impacting the lives of thousands of people. He unabashedly debated the naysayers in print and in public forum. Allow me to recount one such debate with some help. The setting was New Orleans at the ACS Clinical Congress in 1995. An apparent tough and contentious crowd adverse to the innovation of laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. A story portrayed by an actual witness, Prof. Diaz. <laughs> Now our paths first crossed with friendly banter uh, within the setting of Dr. Brian Jacobs' International Hernia Collaboration. I too, amongst the then very tough and contentious crowd, would offer my benefits for robotic inguinal hernia repair. Never did I appreciate the anatomy of the myopictinial orifice more so than under 3D vision. The tremorless precision that's offered to me allows me to dig deeper allows me to peel the peritoneum further off of the psoas muscle. Because logic only dictates if you can see better, you can probably do this operation easier. This wasn't so apparent in my previous lap inguinal experience. But I think from a technical standpoint, what really makes this case easier is that you are automatically triangulated to target, as opposed to chopsticking through dangerous territory. And contrary to what uh, people like uh, Dr. Paul I might suggest, I don't need a randomized control t trial to help me figure out that ergonomically it is easier to operate like this than to operate like this. I first met Prof D uh, Diaz as along with Felix at the ACS Clinical Congress in 2014. Soon thereafter, I asked them for their mentorship to educate me on how to do this repair better. 
Professor Felix provided me the Ten Commandments of Inguinal Hernia Repair. Take a picture, go ahead. This is, uh, this is important stuff. The result of which I improved. I could recognize the planes better. I could do true pre-peritoneal dissection within an avascular plane. Safely reduce the direct inguinal hernia sac. Meticulously reduce the incarcerated femoral hernia sac. Get to Cooper's and well below into the space of Aritzius, isolating the obturator foramina, peeling the peritoneum off the iliacs as well as the psoas, making a larger pocket than I've ever been able to make before, and getting the critical view of the myopitoneal orifice every time. These were typical indications where I would do it open, and now I'm perfectly comfortable offering my patients an MIS repair, an incarcerated femoral hernia, and a utilized firefly. For those of you not familiar, this is like fluorescein in a woods lamp. It helps you evaluate bowel viability in the evaluation of both incarcerated and strangulated segments. I can also do large inguinal scrotal hernias now. Previously, when I did this laparoscopically, I would often just divide the sac and leave the distal sac in situ. But no longer am I physically or ergonomically strained to pull on the sac out of the deep inguinal ring to parietalize the cord structures of the female equivalent. The ability to invaginate the uh, sac within the peritoneal cavity every single time. And then, again, get the critical view of the myopictineal orifice as consistent with the commandments of Felix opening up a large space to accommodate a much larger mesh than I was ever able to produce before. Contouring to the MPO, consistent with Professor Reeves in his first original descriptions and anatomical constructions. And then I can tack, I can suture, and I can spray to seal. Right, Prof Kakuda? and then ultimately re the mesh so it's not exposed to the visceral content. This is an image taken at the International Hernia Collaboration first meeting last year in New York City. Ironically, pioneer of lap inguinal hernia sitting next to one of the pioneers of robotic surgery, Dr. Barry Gardner. You can see at the beginning of the meeting how Prof. Felix was chewing off his fingernails and getting red with anger, perhaps that a fear that an innovation will destroy the old order of things, perhaps that the fear was trespassing upon hollowed ground. But what makes this man so special is not only does he stand firm and steadfast in his beliefs and convictions, he's also man enough to never be afraid to say when he's wrong. When he approached the microphone at the same meeting in the context of robotic hernia repair and announced his mea culpa to the world. And here he I is. I think we're going to be having this argument for another the next pioneer, Dr. Five Eric Wilson. Years, but I, I think it's it's convincing. What? Convincing. Robotic Ernie Perez. Convincing me. Thank you. <laughs> because while he saw his baby grow, perhaps he's frustrated by the fact that it didn't penetrate as much as he thought it should. Because out of the 900,000 inguinal hernia repairs being performed each year, 630,000 of which are still being performed open. Now let's look at the fascinating exponential adoption of robotic inguinal hernia repair in the United States. And these are coming from previous lap inguinal surgeons like myself who have concluded that not only is it easier, that I do this operation better with a robot. And what about the open surgeons who have failed to incorporate MIS hernia repair into their practice probably because they failed to tackle the le steep learning curve, now fe feeling enabled by the platform? So in the most conservative estimates, just imagine this. If we can tip the scales to equivalency, this would translate into an extra 180,000 patients who can enjoy the benefits of an MIS hernia repair that my opponent, my friend and mentor has loved and embraced since the early 90s. Certainly even a statistic that he would feel proud of, a pinnacle of a pioneer's vision. But with this adoption comes the ultimate responsibility to our patients, that we not only learn, but we adhere to well-established principles. And for this, again, I thank Prost Felix, along with Veller and LeBlanc, who joined me at Intuitive Headquarters with a singular goal of mapping out a curriculum and a training pathway to ensure optimal patient outcome. Now here he is teaching Dr. Brian Jacob how to tie a bow tie. And this is Dr. TJ Swope performing the same exact task with a robotic instrument. Old school versus new school. 
yet the end result is exactly the same. Not much different than the tone and content of my debate. Now I have no idea what my opponent's gonna say. He did warn me to wear a cup. In lieu of a cup, I proudly rock this hat backwards because I know when all is said and done, I'm confident that he won't kick me out as one of his charter members of the SSOD. And at the end of the day, I know I can sit down, chill with my friend, have a drink with his beautiful progeny and his unequivocally better half. Thank you very much. Well, I, at least you didn't drop the mic. Yeah, it's, a, it's a tough act to follow. I, and I'd like to thank uh, the members at the table there for inviting me. And I'd like to thank ARP for letting me out today uh, to come here to do this. Uh, Conrad obviously thinks because he started out being nice to me that I would be gentle. <laughs> Forget it. Forget about it. See if I can get this to work. My whole life I prepared my son to lead humanity in the fight against the machines. On this night, we take back our world! My whole life... So how do we get the next slide? Okay, ro robotically assisting one hundred your pair, never. I can't get this darn thing to work. Okay, my disclosures. One, deeply involved, as Conrad has pointed out, for 25 years with hernia repair. Two, as founder of the SSOD, but Conrad is a member of the SSOD, and I will not hold that against him. And I have, as he has shown, consulted one time to try to help Intuitive and the right pathway. One time. They never invited me back. But I want to play the videos. Can I do that with this slight advance, too? Obviously not. The play? There we go. So to quote a famous, I'm not as good. So obviously, I could never run a robot. So uh, <laughs> to quote a, See, I gotta play the videos, and that's not gonna play the videos. Yeah, but it's getting, it's caught up, is what the problem is. Yeah, I got that. I'm trying to get. I it. will not make. Yeah, yeah, I got. It. Thank you, sir. Each an issue of this campaign, I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. Been waiting for you. All right, so okay, Mr. Roboto, let's get down to business here. Enough of this foolery. You have to differentiate between fantasy and reality, and there is a difference, Conrad. And you live in a fantasy world, and we all know about that. You showed that in your own video. When you wake up in the morning, you go to the OI, you think you're going to have this. When you get to the OR, that's what you're stuck with, not that beautiful girl, all right? That's, wake up. What you're trying to do is take a simple operation that we've been able to do for now 25 years with three little sticks and do it correctly. And now you bring in, if I can get. A big robot and try and do the same thing. And you're trying to tell us here today that that is equal. And that's what I'm going to try and tell the audience. Maybe it's not so equal. 
as they say in Thailand, same, same, but different. <laughs> you, give, you give the advantages that you claim as a Roboto surgeon. You say it's easier on the surgeon. You can do it sitting down. This may take me an hour to do this talk. <laughs> as you have in your own OR and have shown on the internet, you have a drink, you have shoes, you got your mask off. And in fact, from the nurses, I have been told once in a while you come in your PJs. <laughs> you bring pizza, you bring wine. What, you know, this is not surgery, this is a party. This is tonight, this is not surgery, Conrad. You say it's easier because you're sitting down. Sitting down is supposed to be a good thing, right? Well, I'm telling your wife that in fact, it's not a good thing, that she's gotta get you up and moving. Because there's been a study showing that if you're sedentary, it's equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And if you're sitting for more than six hours, which many of you are if you're doing these big ventrals or inguinals, you have a higher rate of heart disease, diabetes. You've got to get up and move around. Get out of that chair, Conrad. <laughs> The robot allows you to do it laparoscopically, you say. It's, and, and this is something you stole from Guy Veller. You say it's enabling, right? Though your own words, it's enabling. Well, the next thing you know, we're going to be doing the Tour of America with training wheels <laughs> and the X Games on big toy bicycles with training wheels. Is that what we want to do? Is that how we want to do laparoscopy? No, we don't need training wheels. We need training. How about just adequate education? just mentoring. You've shown my video, so I won't show it again, but you have to know that the fact that I could teach Brian during a gale on a port of a yard of beach to tie a bow tie in a matter of minutes, we can tie, teach almost any of you in this audience to do what he wants to do with a million dollar robot with a couple sticks that cost maybe 50 cents or a dollar. So mentoring is the key. Yeah, you could do like your buddy does with a robot and tie a bow tie, but please, you couldn't even tie that bow tie today. I couldn't. <laughs> I needed a robot. Let me get this in. All right, enough of the stupid thing. <laughs> All right. Okay. So my real question is, is it worth that expensive shortcut to get to the MIS? That's what you'd say. You want the adoption. Robot will get you there. My point is, I don't think we need an expensive thing. We just need good education. We need fellowships, mentoring, residencies, which teach how to do lapar laparoscopy in the proper way. Then you try to tell me that this 3D vision of yours, sounds like something out of a comic book, 3D vision is superior. Where the heck is the data? Where have you ever compared a 3D picture to a 2D picture and had an audience say, oh yeah, that's better, that's better, that's better. That's like someone taking one terrible picture. Oh, here's 2D and it's like, you know, it's like the old TV sets and then against your 3D. There is no data. Standard D 2D has been around for 25 years. It's gotten better, it's good. We have done hernia repairs for 25 years with less than 1% recurrence with a simple 2D camera. What do we need this 3D? Is it, it can it allow me to see through walls? What, what do we need 3D for? Okay, so 2D, 2D seems okay. This picture here is actually about 20 years old. 2D chip, two chip camera, not even three chip. Beautiful picture. If I had a pointer, I could show you. Everybody can see, obviously, the big direct hernia, Cooper's ligament, iliopubic tract. And in fact, you can even see, the, even you can see those nerves. Am I, am I correct? I can see him. You see him. Okay. Do you need 3D? No. Mesh. You, where, what do you need this 3D for? I'm not sure. Okay. Then you tell me in previous lectures, which you didn't even mention today, thank God, is that it decreases hospital stay. What hospital stay? <laughs> Inguinal hernias are done as an outpatient, except in a study I'm going to show you when they were done with a robot. So be careful what you wish. It decreases pain. Really? More claims by robotos on the internet. Marketing decreases pain. Where is the data? No data. PubMed. Let's go to PubMed a minute. We're, you know that's a really that's where we all go. It's like the Bible now. 
I used to read the Bible, now I read PubMed. <laughs> if you look under PubMed and you, and you research laparoscopic hernia repair, you get some 2,000 reports. If you, re, if you look up robotic inguinal hernia repair, you get 20. Oh, that's pretty good, 20 reports, right? No, Th actually 20, 30 reports, 34. And you can say, 34 reports, that's good, but then you go and read them, and out of the 34, only four have anything to do with really inguinal, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. And then you look at those four, and you get down to three, and then you get down from those three, which are ro really robotic with the intuitive, which is what you're talking about. One was single site, which nobody's even talking about anymore, so we'll throw that study right out. We won't even bother with that for the sake of time. And it was only a few patients. And we'll move on to the only two studies that were done with the robot. And you tried to tell earlier, in the previous lectures said, well, it's because there's no ivory tower. I've never in the last 25 years been an ivory tower, but we reported our data. Just because you're out in the clinics and the hospitals in the community, why can't you report data? I don't understand that one. Must be a good reason. You'll tell me in the rebuttal, I'm sure. But here's one of the articles written of the two. This first article is in what you call a premier surgical hernia journal, the Journal of Surgical Oncology. I mean, okay. If I'm going to write an article about robotic hernia, I'm surely going to put it in the Journal of Surgical Oncology. What, are you kidding me? But then the same authors did come back later this year and publish the same data, again, with a couple more cases. And what they showed was, in fact, they had, what, 78 patients, 123 hernias. Uh, they don't even give you how much. They have 30-day follow-up. They talk about no pain. No, there's nothing about long-term follow-up. So I don't even know from the one article that I can find, and maybe it's because I'm old I couldn't find it, if there is data to say that the robotic hernia is even equal to the laparoscopic. So then you say, and you said today, it allows new techniques. You can do suture, suture repairs. You can do tactless hernia repairs. Please, we've been doing tactless hernia repairs now for 20 years since they came out with, with meshes that we don't need to tack. You don't need to fix them. So why do you need a robot? Then you talk about perfect triangulation, best critical view. I don't see any difference between your view, your view and the view we have with a laparoscope. Then you talked about today, oh my goodness, it allows you to reduce the sac. Well, number one, you can reduce the sac laparoscopically, and number two, from the beginning of time when they did hernia repairs, we've shown that you can transect the sac and there's absolutely no difference, so why make a big deal about the fact that you can pull the sac out? Because we all, who are good hernia surgeons, know you can cut it and leave the distal sac with no complications. I assume you do know that, right? Okay. And then if you tell me in other lectures, it allows you to do hernias that you couldn't do otherwise. I don't know. I, maybe I'm just crazy, but I never found a hernia I really couldn't logically approach laparoscopically. So maybe you'll find me one, but what the heck. <laughs> Give me another second here. Where we go. Got to... Precision optimize, another one of your terms. I don't even know what that one means, so I can't debate it. Then here's one of the most important things you've said. It gives you the biggest tool on the block. There is no question about that, Conrad, and we know that you need the biggest tool on the uh -oh. block. Uh -oh. <laughs> and then probably this is the one thing I will agree with you. It builds your practice through marketing of your latest and greatest biggest tool on the block. Okay, where's the data? Obviously, you've said it's not in the journals, negative PubMed. It's definitely on social media, and everybody knows from my debate yesterday, I'm stuck on social media. I'm addicted to that one. But all you find on social media for robotic hernia repairs are case reports, anecdotes, not data. Can you say that? Anecdotes, not data. Thank you. But where you do find robotic hernia repair is one of the most premier sites for surgical research in the United States, the YouTube. <laughs> if you look on YouTube, there are some 50,000 
reports of inguinal hernia repair. I don't know, I, there haven't been 50,000 done, so somebody's reporting the same one over and over and over again. <laughs> because <laughs> this is like watching uh, reruns uh, of the Disney channels, you know? And when you look at these repairs, which I have done, and I unfortunately spent nights trying to find good ones, the problem was most of the ones I found, whoops, let's go back. If I can, thank you. Play that, maybe I should just have him play it, it'd be easier. If you look at these, they start out like you showed today, yours was a nice repair, and I must compliment you on that. But if you go on the internet where these people think they're putting up good repairs, 90% of them are not. They start out, they're eloquent, but if anybody does hernia repair, we'll watch, never reduces the direct sac completely, never takes down the indirect sac completely, then throws in a piece of mesh, which is the wrong kind of mesh, and then blindly anchors it. I, d I don't understand what they're doing. And what frightens me the most is they're presenting these things on YouTube to the public thinking they're good repairs. I'm sorry for taking so long, Ryan. This is just, I definitely, Intuitive will not give me a robot after today. <laughs> Come on, baby. So I think what it is is sometimes you think you're doing what you're doing, but in fact, you're not. You're fooling yourself. That is your typical Roboto surgeon. <laughs> Whoops, go back. Can you go back one? God damn it. If I don't, this is, no, I gotta, one second. Let's go right there. There we go. Boom, boom, boom. Somebody went back too far, not me. So, is RTAP really mimicking LTAP? Now we'll get serious and I'll quit clowning around. So this is really the debate right here. RTAP must equal LTAP. It must follow the established principles. As you said, my 10 commandments, if you don't, God's gonna get you. No shortcuts, no unproven deviations. If you do, you will be destined to fail with your RTAP. You will never sell it I will sell my robotic intuitive stock short because if you don't mimic it, you're done. From YouTube review, I rarely see good repairs. There are some, but not many. Let's assume, however, that you are right, Conrad. Based on the IHC postings, on YouTube videos, you can rest. I don't know who, you're supposed to be babysitting here and you're just you're not taking care of the kids. <laughs> the robotic tap you say is safe, efficient, at least equal to tap. The robotic enables surgeons to perform an MIS repair and you said I will love that and there's, no, and there's no question if there's more repairs that I'll drink to that. Okay, I agree with you. But can we afford the R tap? Will it add too much cost every day? Who will pay for this added cost? The hospital, right now that's who's eating the cost, the hospital. The surgeon, as soon as we go to, to single payer, that money's coming out of your pocket and I don't think you want it to come out of your pocket. You won't be able to afford that new bow tie you bought for today's event. 60 seconds. The patient. More. What, okay. Where's the big bang for the buck? What should your hospital buy for the million dollars? Should they buy you another robot? I don't think so. And Aston Martin's a lot better because it will appreciate unlike your robot. The RTAP will survive the test of time if it mimics laparoscopic repair, only if it follows the basics of anatomy and only if it can be done efficiently. It will fade away if recurrence and complications are done by poorly educated surgeons, if insurance is refused to pay. I will never say never, however, and this is my most important video and was the most discouraging day of my life. <laughs> and it, whoops, go back. Don't go, uh, I gotta show this video for Brian. Give me a second, Brian. Damn it. 
This is killing me. I'm sick. Can you play the video back there? Thank you. Get it out. Well, he has trouble left. with the snap, and the ball is free. It's picked up by Michigan State. Jalen wants Jackson, and he scores on the last play of the game. Unbelievable. So, two things. Never say never, and understand, just like robotic surgery, the guy from Michigan State who scored that touchdown, his own players fractured his hip, and he is done. So, and as Conrad said, two ball guys play the video, two ball guys whacking it out. We are friends, but we do disagree. That one's Conrad, he only has one hair.